Hello there, and welcome to another Leadership Reflection. I'm Mikko from the Body of Christ, and today we are talking about truth, honesty, and love. Reflecting on a little bit on those topics, and this is probably a short video about this larger topic of honesty, uh, which is a major important topic. Have you ever heard this sentence that, we must speak truth, but we must speak truth in love, or something along those lines. I personally have heard that statement many times uh, by certain ministries. And while it is a nice statement, just to me it feels like there's some sort of compromise built within it. Like this sort of implication that truth and love are opposites and i would like to address that misconception today so truth and love are they the opposites are they con contrasting to each other are they in conflict with each other at least they shouldn't be if we see that jesus said that i am truth the way and life and nobody comes to Father except through me. Whereas John speaks of the Father or God as love himself. So, and Jesus is stated that he is one with the Father. So, truth and love are in the same character of God. So, how can there be a kind of a disharmony? between those two things. Uh, why would you need to compromise on that if they're part of the same character? I don't think God is misharmonious in that way or disharmonious. So that's one argument, but you could say that's technicalities and practicalities. We still have to deal with this issue. So let's see what's the issue, what it might be, why we're even saying something like this in the first place. And I guess... Some of you have heard this, although this hasn't been heard in, in recent times so much, but of these sort of preachers that go to the street corners or go to the restaurants and where people sit and mind their own business. And then they start proclaiming the judgment of God, like, you know, repent or else, turn or burn, you know, <laughs> this sort of thing. Or you lousy sinners, you reprobates and murderers and adulterers and, and this sort of thing, you're going to go to hell. That sort of preaching. One could say that that's truth. That's not in law. Uh, and that's probably the kind of argument made with this sort of statement in the first place, I think. So what, there the statement describes apply grace. <laughs> but... Um, what is this man doing here? And hopefully I can address this issue, especially in the ministry of prophet. Let's see if we can do that during this process. But what is he doing? Uh, I'd like to s point out that there's a difference between uh, truth and condemnation or correction and condemnation, even rebuke and condemnation. So what are those words? Uh, we have rebuke, we have correction, we have, let's say, exhortation. All of these words, very biblical and different to under difficult to understand. We don't use these words too much in the normal language, except when you have learned to use this. So rebuke, correction, exhortation, let's say edification as well. These are words that might describe a ministry of a prophet. And then we have here judgment and condemnation. And what are we dealing with here? So, and this is just my understanding. Actually, I should have probably checked these words up before looking into this. So this is just my kind of top of my head kind of understanding, I might be completely wrong here. 
But rebuke, in my opinion, and comes to my mind this scripture which says, um, the wounds of a friend are faithful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. So that to me connects here. This is from Proverbs 27, I think. 27, 6, it might have been. Uh, but this is like something that feels bad but has a good outcome. So, for example, um, David, after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, um, the prophet Nathan came to him and described to his, him this parable, and based on his response on this parable, Nathan, I would say, rebuked him, saying that you're not better than this person in the parable. Actually, you're much worse. You behaved in a very wrong way here with Bathsheba murdering his husband. And what you did was wrong. Repent. And what that is, that is, while that may seem to many people like condemnation, I will go to that in a moment, it actually is not. Because it is a call to repentance. And if it was condemnation, there's no need for repentance there. Condemnation is like the uh, guilty statement. Not, not even that. It's actually like declaration of punishment or declaration of consequences. So it is like past redemption. Redemption is like when you're still moving, this is your adversary here or the other party whom you have offended and you're going to the court together. Here's the courthouse. And like Jesus said, while you're still in the road, <laughs> make good with your with the other person who has an offense with you so that you don't have to go to court and you don't have to lose the case and be judged. So here, he may rebuke you if, if there's love. And actually, a rebuke is made out of love, really. Because it, they don't have an obligation to give you an opportunity to repent, really. But... If they, or maybe some prophet here, comes and rebukes you, says, this is what you did, and this is how it's wrong, this is what God wants from you, God wants to extend Christ for you, repent and receive the Christ and make it better. So you hear this, this word of rebuke, it stings in your heart, like, for example, when Peter, Peter preached after the day of Pentecost or during the day of Pentecost, he preached to the Jews that you killed the Messiah. You killed Jesus. His blood is on your hands. You need to repent from your sins. That was, that was from the Holy Spirit, from the Spirit of God. That's not a sin to speak something like that. And that, what happened? They got pricked in their hearts and like, he's correct. It, it sucks, but he's correct. And then the question is, what can I do about it? And without the love of God, and that's why maybe that we speak truth in love statement actually holds value. Without love of God, without a sense and understanding of the love of God, it can be too much to handle for them. And they can harden their hearts and turn away from you and say, no, you did worse. You're the real sinner. I'm not going to face it. Because they don't have grace to face that sin because it's too big. They cannot compensate for it for themselves. That's why it's so important to understand Jesus' sacrifice and God's love that he already has paid for that sin. So you don't have to pay for it, but you have to repent of it. And you can repent of it only because Jesus paid for your sin. So... But let's say this person understands he has a relationship with God and he understands that Jesus died for his sins. And now he, he gets pricked in his heart and understands like, oh, what I did was actually really wrong. And what you have done against me, you know, because I was bitter against you or whatever, actually that's, that's really small in comparison. Like in the parable of the servants who had loaned someone else money and, you know, had a big loan on themselves. But um, 
but he understands like, oh man, like I did really wrong. And then what he does, he repents and hopefully openly repents to his, this person here and says like, I did wrong. Can you forgive me? I'm like, I misbehaved here. I hurt you. This is bad what I did. And repenting to God because all our sin, really, Jesus is the one who pays for it. Even though you hurt the other person, who's going to heal the other person? Who's going to suffer the consequences of their sin, really? Who's going to pay for it? It's Jesus. He's going to carry the pain that he went through so that he back, he can be healed. So it, it is really you heard Jesus when you heard other people. But repenting and, and hopefully this other person finds grace and, and that can resolve the situation and that can lead to a major transformation. So rebuke can be very, very helpful and I believe it is very strong uh, expression of love. Because really, like, if you're a prophet, like, there's two uh, two reasons you would rebuke someone, especially in the ministry of a prophet. One is that God told you to do that. And you're being obedient to God and doing what he told you to do. Second one is that you love the other person or God's love flows through you to that other person and you creep because of what they do and you you desire for them to make a change and you see that it's important for them to make a change for their own sake not necessarily because you've been hurt but because the other person will hurt themselves and you hurt others if they continue to behave in that manner so really uh, the pure motive of a rebuke is love how about correction Correction is like maybe a milder form of rebuke. It's, um, I think it's pretty much the same thing, but it's like redirection. So let's say you present, you present your, uh, make a presentation to your leader and he had directed you to do this and this, maybe do your sales presentation for this company or prepare the sales presentation. And you present it to him, seeking for an approval for that so you can continue with the sales process. But he will, if, if it's not like good enough or uh, how, it, how I could say approval, then the leader, as a leader, you have to correct them. So you say, hey, what you did here is good and here, and this is good. But this needs to be corrected. This needs to be changed before we can present this to our potential client. Um, so directing a correction to something. So these are very, very closely connected and perform the same function pretty much. Uh, rebuke is it's more like a strong correction with an like exhortation to change. So ex exhortation, again, same thing pretty much it implies the sort of emotional, strong message that, like, I need you to do this. I need you to change in this way. Like, very similar, all of these. And then edification, I, I think it's a very good word, something that we all should add to our vocabulary, in my opinion. Edification is something that builds, something that makes things better, something that improves. And the point of us in the body of Christ is to edify each other and ourselves, for example, through speaking in tongues, uh, that we build the body of Christ and present the body of Christ fully acceptable and perfect in front of Jesus for his coming. So except edification is like an umbrella term and all of these when applied correctly fall under that umbrella term. So. What about judge, judgment and condemnation? Um, condemnation, I think. First of all, it says in, in the Bible that there is no condemnation to those who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Like, as sons of God, when we are on the right path, 
when we are following the Spirit, there is no condemnation. Even though there might be missteps, there might be need for correction, there might be need for rebuke, but there is no condemnation because of the love of God. Because love of God is so deep that all of those trespasses and sins are like sunk into that deep ocean of love and absorbed by it. And he goes through the pain of being hurt by those sins, but he forgives. He doesn't lash back. He doesn't close himself. He doesn't harden his heart toward us and be like, that's enough. Now, get the hell out of here kind of thing. No, his his love is something else. Uh, so his love is much greater than than our sins. So when we are on on that right path, when we are on that shelf relationship with God, there is no condemnation. That's what I believe based on Scripture. But condemnation, what it is, is like if I would condemn. <laughs> For example, um, let's say I had a computer that kept crashing. And I could do this. I could condemn that computer. You're not worthy to be used in my ministry or work or whatever. I condemn you and then I throw you into the trash because I quit using you. I don't use that computer. It is declared unusable or unworthy or like that's it, kind of thing. Um, judgment, same kind of thing. It is like rebuke is something that you do while you're going to court. Judgment is what happens in the court. And we have a, an obligation from God, really, to edify through these ways. But it is not under our kind of jurisdiction or under our, our authority to judge because God is the judge. And maybe I will exclude here real judges, um, those who have the ministry of a judge within the body of Christ. Uh, but even then, what they should do is to delegate that judgment to the Holy Spirit and Jesus who holds all judgment and um, listen to the Holy Spirit and see, declare that judgment that the Holy Spirit has spoken. For example, Peter, again, when Ananias and Sapphira uh, lied to the Holy Spirit about their financial gift and, and she, there Peter declared judgment upon them and he said, I, that's it. You will not you will not live here alive, basically. And instantly, they died, or one after another. Um, and he was declaring the judgment of God upon them, and which was manifested instantly. So it was not Peter that killed them; it was God who killed them, in my perspective. Um. But Peter was the mouthpiece from through whom that judgment was declared. So sometimes we might have the position of declaring judgment, but it is not in ourselves to make that judgment or to condemn that other person. It is up to God because he is the judge. He is the superior judge and the real judge. But we can perform that function of speaking out the judgment of God sometimes. Not the most typical uh, ministry, but still, there it is. And God is very patient. God applies a lot of grace and a lot of mercy and a lot of patience to our sins. And speaking of greater things than sins, like just neglect or enmity towards God and his word, enmity towards the kingdom of God. God is very patient even with his enemies and he's waiting for it and giving everyone a chance to repent and to make things right and to turn to him and go under his love. 
and to receive that love. But it's not forever suffering in that sense. And sometimes after that period of grace, mercy and patience, there comes a day of judgment. Of course, the final judgment is the final day of judgment, but for some people, fortunately, I would say, even, that day of judgment may come earlier. And that, while many people think, like, how can the loving God send people to hell, or how can the loving God judge or kill anyone? If you think of a ministry of a truthful and righteous judge, it is a very helpful ministry. And unfortunately, we're lacking that, like, very, very much these days. We have very corrupted judges, and judgment is being perverted every day. But the function of a really righteous judge is to judge between two individuals who, like, judge when someone has suffered wrong in the hands of another. Like, that typically demands justice, especially when there's no repentance. Like, if there's no repentance, what's that gonna, that other person is going to do? He has determined himself to continue hurting others. So what a judge does is place an end to that evil. Without judges, there would be no end to evil, basically. They would just continue and continue, like, imagine all the worst leaders and, and worst murderers and genocidists in the earth. If they had could live like 120 years and nobody would prevent them from uh, continuing their evil. I mean, that's bad. And even in the book of Revelations, the spirits of the righteous men shout to God and ask God, how long, how long will you suffer this? That those people who killed us, how long will you watch this and not judge? But God will say to them, there will come a day of judgment. Judgment is very important, but it is a very important function of a judge, not you. Because if you judge out of position, you become under judgment. Because you have to you have to reach that same standard yourself, or otherwise you're judging yourself. Like, you judge someone of lying. Like, he's a liar. He's worthy of death. And you're a liar. What are you worthy of? Death. By your own words. Like David, who judged that person in the parable that he's worthy of death. What did he declare? He declared judgment upon himself because he was that parable's person, and even worse. So his judgment was death upon that person. But God in his grace wouldn't apply his own judgment, although death followed. So it is not wise to judge out of position. Declaring God's judgment sometimes is different. But here... I would say this often is out of place condemnation and judgment. And I'm not condemning again this ministry. I believe this is and probably will be an increasingly important ministry in the future. And many revivals probably were edified because of this sort of ministry. And if you think of the ministry of John the Baptist, it was a rebuking ministry, correction ministry. Really. He called people to repentance, and he called the Pharisees snake seeds, or one of those little snake saplings. And, and he was not very um, graceful in his uh, appearance to those those um, who wouldn't wouldn't repent, who would resist the kingdom of God. So, what can we learn from this? Now, we have kind of introduced the, the uh, words, but I hope this, this already gives you a perspective into, like, what is truth and why truth, like, truth is different. There's, like, 
truth out of place or like it's not even truth it's like just you operating in your own flesh kind of thing it's not love but what's new there you operating in your flesh is when has it been love ever but that has nothing to do with truth so making this sentence that truth has to be speaking in love with the implication that those are kind of contrasting to each other with the implication that some sort of compromise needs to be made or people need to be kind of placated into kind of becoming your friends. Um, basically what you're doing is you're self-censuring the, the truth. So you're applying censorship and you're thinking like, well, God must not have meant that when he said that that's wrong. God must not have set these standards for these way, days. And what do we see in so many ministries? Just by the word, not even understanding, but just by using the word grace, what you're doing is, is you're just living an easy life, not facing the truth of the matter and playing around as if things had no consequences and really not applying God's love because you don't care shit about what what happens to that other person. Like for example, um, if we take a uh, scene of uh, like a sexual thing, like homosexuality for example, like if you don't address that sin, let's say you, you're a pastor, for example, and you have a church, so you're in a leadership position and sort of moral leadership position even. And people are looking up to you for kind of moral advice. Because if you're not going to give it who is like the school, you know what they're going to say. But uh, that's kind of your position in this assumption. Now, you fail to address that sin in your church. What's going to happen? Those people, those young people, are going to absolutely destroy their own identities, their own bodies, their mind, by operating dysfunctionally in that way. And thinking, advised again by the school system and the world and the media, that that's normal and that's their destiny or that's who they are, having a false identity and really living a miserable life. Like, you're not, you're not loving. You're, you're facilitating their death. You're facilitating their pain and their suffering. You think that's easy life? You think that's easy? You don't know nothing. But it's like you don't care or you're too timid. You're too timid to address that, um, that issue in your church. And that's why... You shouldn't be a leader if you're too timid to do that because you're hurting others with your timidity by not addressing things, by not speaking the truth, by not operating in God's love, but being so self-centered, self-focused. What would they say? What would the media say? What would... Will I get censored if I say this? What's your mind running about? It's running about you, 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 your nice ministry and your paycheck. What about those people God has entrusted to you, given to your church, for you to disciple them? What about them? They're going to go and suffer. They're going to go and face the consequences of those sins. They're going to ruin their life, not even knowing anything in their ignorance. And you're just, their blood is on your hands. And that's why it is not it's not easy to be a leader or to be a teacher because really you're responsible for those people to an extent. At least you're responsible for forming this ministry to rebuke, to correct, to exhort, to edify them, allowing them to make the decision. And if they choose not to repent, if they choose to go with it anyway, then that's their decision. It's not your decision. They make the decisions in their life and they deal with that with God and with every person that they hurt. But 
then you have done your duty. But if you don't do that, you're placing yourself in great danger. So I wouldn't advise leading in that sort of position. It's dangerous. Whew, anyway, got a little bit emotional there. But it's a, it's a difficult and somewhat emotional subject, you know. Uh, but this sort of compromise message, it's a lie. I believe it's a lie designed to silence the church and really a lie designed by Satan to continue that that evil, to give him free reign in those people's lives. Because if he can make you the compromise with this sort of BS, um, he can prevent light reaching into their, those people's lives. He can prevent them ever getting to the point of repentance. And what that means is that he has rulership over the life continuously. So who wins? He wins in that situation by our passivity. Again, I remind you, we are much stronger than Satan because of the authority that we carry. But our passivity is not stronger than anything. Our activity is stronger. And us following God is stronger. So, wanted to address that this issue of compromise, of not speaking the truth, not operating in honesty because of really fear of persecution, like we saw in this example. And sometimes this misconception that it is not loving to operate in the truth. You know, you will have these people, this LG, whatever, Q, B, S, stuff, people come tell you what is love when they don't know anything about love. They have no clue because God is love and they don't know God. And by them, I mean the people at the top, the people, really Satan who is orchestrating that whole thing, that whole hype about, about destroying yourself. You're not in a position to take their word for what is love. You have a greater responsibility to God. And like, you're here, this is a crowd shouting to you or showing sh signs or like, love, you must love, whatever. Love. And here's God. And what did Jesus say? To a person who is like, okay, I, I guess I will self-censure myself. I will not speak about this subject anymore. Even though it hurts my church, I might not think about it that way. I'm too self-focused to think about it that way, really. But I'm going to self-censor myself and not speak about this anymore. What is Jesus going to say? He already said what he's going to say. He said that anyone who's ashamed of me in front of these people, I'm ashamed of that person in front of my father. I think that's a good thing. I think that's something that's desirable. You're grieving the Holy Spirit. You're placing yourself in danger here. And you need a rebuke now. No, not those people. You need a rebuke. And good news is that maybe someone will rebuke you. Maybe this is a rebuke to you. Hopefully it is. Because what it gives to you, it gives to you a chance to repent. What that means is you're saying, I was wrong. I was thinking of myself. I let my timidity get in the way of my responsibility. And I tell sense of myself. I need to make a change. This cannot continue like this. God have mercy on me. And then your sin, whatever it was, whether it was this or something else, you can give it under the cross of Jesus. And Jesus already paid for your sin. And now you're free to operate in righteousness and true holiness and speak the truth in real love 
which is God's love. There is no truth outside of love. So you don't have to worry about whether you're speaking truth in love or not. If you're speaking the truth, you're speaking into love. There is no truth outside of that. There are just facts. And I use quotation marks around those because they're partial facts, which is partial lies. So then you can repent, then you can change, then you can form a deeper relationship with God. You can use that experience as something to exhort others with. You know, I did this mistake. Don't do the same mistake. Here are the consequences that I faced. And here's how God loved me through that process. Here's how awesome he is through my sin. And you can glorify God through your sin. Doesn't mean that God placed that sin in your life. Doesn't mean that it was right. No, it was not right. We don't need to be so religious and that kind of theological that we need to make good bad and bad good, but you can still glorify God with it, okay? God can turn everything into good. Doesn't make everything good. So, I hope this was edifying to you and hope you got some level of understanding from the Holy Spirit, really, about what are we called to do. And this is, of course... Um, you need to apply this to your situation specifically. You know, are you called to be a prophet? Are you called to be a pastor? Are you called to be a teacher? Are you called to be an apostle? What kind of ministry God has designed for you? How he wants to op- you to operate specifically? What's his grace in your life? And then let the Holy Spirit apply this truth to that situation. Because what I'm speaking here, for example, about this judgment thing, I mean, it might totally not meet your ministry at all. You might never need this. Maybe you only need it to not judge those who operate in that ministry. But maybe you are a prophet, and this is exactly what God told you to do. And you've been self-centering yourself for your whole life because the church seems to hate that sort of prophecy. Let the Holy Spirit apply this to your life and to your ministry and your calling and to edify you and create you and and hopefully this is of edification to you. And quickly, just one more thing I wanted to speak about, actually prophets. And this is from the book of Micah, I think, or at least the example of Micah. Maybe it's in the churches or, or the kings or somewhere around there. There's this situation where this king, I think, Isaiah or whatever, really loves the king of Israel, had surrounded himself with these prophets. Maybe they were real prophets, I don't know, maybe they were not. But he had this, and he had this king friend over here, and they were planning a war in this other kingdom here. I think it was the Assyrian they were like, let's ask the wise men and the prophets what to do. Because at least they had so much sense to get the wisdom of the prophets who who they had placed around themselves. And they did a really wise thing there in general, as we have learned in other contexts. But what did these prophets say? They said, <laughs> sorry, they said, peace, peace, victory. Conquering, you will defeat the Assyrians. You know, you're going to be promoted. You're going to be so great and awesome and everything's going to go just fine. Trust us. Kind of the speaking good things, good things. And uh, this is what you really want to hear as a king from a prophet, you know, that you're going to succeed and it's going to go well. And many prophets do this maybe unconsciously, maybe many divinators do this, and they just speak peace, peace, because that's what you want to hear. It's not what you need to hear necessarily, but that's what you want to hear. So they speak what you want to hear, especially the those using divining spirits. Uh, but in this case, uh, this other king was like, 
he was somewhat wise, although very. St- well, I maybe not condemned him, but he seemed to behave in a stupid way by associating with this not so wise king. This, this one's very happy about it. He had like a little smug about his prophet crowd. Um, but this other king is like, don't we have any other prophet that can give up give advice? This this group demonstrates group thinking, in my opinion. That's me adding things in the story. Um, Ahaziah or whatever said that, yeah, we have this one prophet, but I dislike that prophet because he operates in the gift of rebuke and he always tells me to repent and I never do. And he's really stupid because of that, because I don't repent. But the other king is like, hey, let's go talk to him. So they go talk to him and he's like, oh, peace, peace. You're going to win. Next. But this guy's like, hey, you never tell me peace, peace. What's up? And he's like, yeah, well, God told me you're going to die and you're going to lose really badly. And that he sent like lying spirits to your prophets so that you would go into war and kill yourself, basically. And it's going to go really bad for you. And that's God's judgment to you. And that's really, that's operating, I guess, in the gift of judgment. <laughs> we can call it that. Uh, Old Testament things, you needed that much more, you know, in that situation. But <laughs> where was I? Yeah, he was not a popular prophet because of this kind of type of prophecies. And in certain context, you would say, like, Micah, you're not operating in the gift of prophecy. You're not edifying. You're just condemning them. You're speaking your bad story, blumbers. You know, nobody likes you because of what you're doing. But what he was doing is speaking what the Holy Spirit told him to. And that's really what the prophets are supposed to do, you know? Not appease people. Not tell them what they want to hear. He, he actually told him what he needed to hear. And had he some sense to repent, at least had this other king some sense to repent, he could have just said, oh wow, God's right, maybe I shouldn't go there. Even though he, he like, passed judgment on me, but, like, realistically, he would have had the chance to repent even that. But no, he goes to war anyway. Kind of strange, isn't it? But, really, this was... This was the most useful sentence, this king over here, even though it was the least popular sentence and, and it stinged his heart the most and he was m- probably most frustrated with this person. And that's why it says in the Proverbs that faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. That these people just telling what he wants to hear, if he goes to war and kills himself, Well, then we just have another king thinking of themselves, aren't they? But this this guy, well, he was basically thinking of God, and that I think is good. But when you have a friend who comes to tell you something difficult or a word of rebuke, he's placing his relationship, his image in your eyes on the line because he wants good for you, or he wants to be obedient to God. Either way, that's a really valuable friend. And it's wise to surround yourself with that sort of people and to create culture of that sort of communication. And if you're interested in, in that topic, um, I recommend you to check this, um, this video here <laughs> about Safe Harbor that deals exactly how to start creating a culture like that and what that culture might look like. And of course, we are most likely going to continue with the topic of honesty. So con- recommend you to carry on and join us in the next video where we'll, we'll discuss something on those lines. I don't know yet exactly what. See you there.